Hello and welcome. This is the Clearing the Hurdles to Success in Your STEM Career panel. I'm Robin Hauser. I'm a documentary filmmaker. Um, for relevance with this topic, I am director and producer of a film called Code Debugging the Gender Gap. And with me today, I am thrilled to have Sandra McLeod, who's head of security assurance for Zoom, Lauren Knossenberger, the CIO of the United States Air Force, and Tracy Chow, CEO and founder of Block Party. Welcome, ladies. Hi, good to be here. Thrilled to have you. Sandra, I'm going to start with you. You've worked in software uh, engineering for many years. Can you identify some of these hurdles that we're talking about? Um, so just to be clear, in terms of uh, you know career, and um, I, I think one of the things that I found is just really believing that we can can reach for things that we might not have thought were um, that we're qualified for. I think a lot of times we all uh, face that sort of imposter syndrome. Um, am I good enough? Am I uh, as good as the others? Do I belong here? And so I think that's really one of the biggest things that I've you know that I've struggled with personally, you know, and, and I hear from a lot of other people in the industry, not just from women. So, you know, I think that's one of those things is knowing that, yes, I do belong here. Yes, I am as good as the others. And yes, I, I should go for those things that, you know, I, I, we talk about how um, men often are more likely to uh, apply to roles that they uh, don't have all meet all the qualifications where uh, women don't often uh, feel like we should and we sometimes hold back. So I think that's, you know, one of the biggest things is going for it and believing that we belong here. Especially when you're probably often uh, the only or the one of few women in the room. Indeed, absolutely. In, in college and often the room now in, this, in my career, uh, yes, it's, it's absolutely the case. Yeah. Lauren, as CIO of the United States Air Force, I think um, probably our unconscious bias is that we just saw the title most of us would in our minds envision a man. Um, you obviously um, have had to, you know, you're often the only woman in the room or one of few women in the room. What are some of the barriers uh, that you think contribute to the low representation of women in STEM? Sure. Well, first, first I'll say that if they had guessed that I was a guy, they would have been right every other time. So I, I am actually the first um, female chief information officer of, of the Air Force. And, um, and just by sheer luck, the first for the Space Force. Um, just standing. And kudos, kudos to you for that, by the way. Oh, well, thank you. Um, so I'll just, I'll share that. Um, so I was one of those people that grew up and, and actually just I, I thought STEM was awesome and actually pretty much all of the other subjects I was like, oh, that's too fluffy. Um, and it wasn't until probably college or even grad school that that I saw as much merit uh, on the other side of things, you know, kind of more the language arts. Um, so I was kind of an odd case. Um, and growing up, I didn't I didn't really kind of notice or understand that there weren't as many women interested because I was just doing my thing. Um, I do notice more now that, um, you know, fewer women in the rooms that I'm in. And, um, and I think that Sandra just did such a good job um, actually hitting on some of those roadblocks. I think it is just being able to see yourself, um, certainly in those positions, um, at least in the Air Force today, we now have someone, you know, that is a woman that is the tech boss. So people can um, now see that that example, um, you know, in my world. And we're having and we're having more of those examples. So um, I love I love the old. I think it was Sally Ride. If you can't see it, you can't be it. Quote. Um, you know, that's just a great one. I think knowing if it's for you. And um, and we had such a great example of this actually with Udacity where uh, we had stood up Digital U and the whole point of Digital U within the Air Force was to say, we don't care what we hired you for. Um, this is here for anybody that has talent or aptitude in STEM. You wanna come and you wanna learn how to code. You wanna learn data science. You wanna learn AI. You wanna be a cloud engineer, come and learn. By only aptitude, we care nothing about you other than you're passionate and you want to work. And we didn't have that many women sign up until actually Udacity reached out and said, we really want to do this women in STEM scholarship. And then all of a sudden, our female airmen and guardians were beating down my door. They knew it was for them. They knew it was only for them. They weren't taking a spot from anyone else. Um, you know, and they knew that it was also, um, even for folks that 
weren't necessarily in a STEM career field then, which is still largely men, um, that we were opening those, those doors and the women crushed it. And they were able to immediately apply what they learned, um, see the value of the data in front of them, and also um, share with all of their colleagues and teach others. And that was just, it was incredibly powerful. And like, I've heard of that happening before. It was just so um, just inspiring and, and in our faces when that happened in the Air Force. And, and the last thing that I'll share is that I think that um, I think that the culture around a lot of STEM fields is changing in a really positive way. Um, and and so like in software development, for instance, um, you know, they're for like kind of the the older millennials and the kind of younger Gen Xers, like software developers at the time, you know, the stereotype was, you know, coding in a dark room, kind of working independently, you know, drinking Mountain Dew and eating Doritos. And, you know, culturally, um, you know, I think was not as appealing to a lot of women. Um, the culture now is so collaborative. You're bringing the art into the design process. It's much more about what you can imagine the functionality should be, even than just developing the functionality. And developers are so much more involved in every stage of the process and in meeting those user needs. And so I think that's a more kind of well-rounded experience that more people, including women um, and, uh, and other un underrepresented folks in STEM will be more uh, attracted to. You bring up such a good point, the importance of role models. I know you have two daughters and how lucky they are because seeing their mom as CIO of the United States Air Force, certainly they have an, a role model, um, which means that they can see something, they can believe that they can be it. Sandra, was there someone in your life that, that um, or a role model for you that led you to believe that even when you were one of the few software engineers in school um, and in, in the workplace, that helped you um, get through some of the more difficult times? Um, you know, definitely there, I had some fabulous, I would say almost more mentors. Um, I, I can't think of a specific role model that looked like me that I, um, I specifically identified with, but I had some amazing mentors who said, you can do this. You are, um, you know, you're worth it. You can do this. You are going to be successful. And they helped me to believe that I could be. So yeah, I, I think those mentors were uh, a huge part of, of how I got started and my success. Tracy, I first interviewed you in 2013 when I was filming co-debugging the gender gap. Um, and you were at Pinterest at the time and you had just started challenging the tech industry to show the numbers. Um, you had you really were the first whistleblower to say, this is crazy, why aren't there more female software engineers in Silicon Valley, in tech in general? Um, and the numbers were shockingly low. They were less than 20% in, in mo most of the cases, even when there was so many unfilled computer science related jobs in the industry. So can you share with us a little bit your views You know, now since those days, have the numbers moved? Um, is there, is there progress? Yeah, um, so I think the first thing I would make a minor correction on is like, I don't think I was the first to raise these issues. I think I was well positioned and maybe was speaking about the issues at a time that industry was slightly more willing to hear it. And oftentimes when you see people who are the first, it's not really that they were truly the first, it's just that people before them were paving the path so that they could come along. Um, in terms of the progress since 2013 to now, eight years later, um, the data has been very good for establishing that baseline to understand where we are, which I think is very critical so that we can at least get past the denial that there is a problem. I think that was a very big like step function change to get us to like acknowledging not just within industry, but externally to the industry, people could actually see what the, what the data was like. Um, and prior to the data being available, I think anybody who worked in tech kind of knew that we had a diversity problem and like anybody who ever stepped on the campus of any of these tech companies would have known, but it was very difficult to talk about in the absence of data and people outside of tech wouldn't necessarily have, have known to pay attention. So we now know that there's a problem. Over the last eight years, I think there's been much more awareness, which is great. And I think we've advanced um, the nuance in our discussion so that uh, diversity no longer just means more gender diversity. I think we're much better at acknowledging that there's many forms of diversity beyond gender. Um, we're talking about concepts like intersectionality, which I think is a big improvement. Um, and I think all of this stuff 
has to come before we see other changes like in, in, the, in the hard data. The actual data has not moved as much as I think any of us would have liked. Um, it does seem like gender diversity numbers have improved marginally, sometimes unfortunately at the cost of racial diversity, which does bring us to broader points around how we need to make solutions for diversity, equity, inclusion be truly comprehensive and not just advantaging and privileging one class, whether it's white women at the expense of all other forms of diversity, because we can now check off gender. Um, and it does speak to how this movement does need to get broader, more comprehensive. Um, I'm encouraged by the progress in terms of the discourse and like so many more people are thinking about these issues now. Um, oftentimes when I talk to founders, even in the earliest ages, they're asking, how to set up their companies for greater diversity and inclusion, even at the earliest stages, which is not something that I would have seen before. Um, but I think it also does take time for the widespread changes to come about. The really big companies, it's just hard to change their percentages very much. If you're starting at an employee base of 100,000, for example, like you're not going to quickly shift those percentages. Um, you see it more with startups and I'm encouraged by startups of today caring much more about diversity because some of the startups today will become the really big tech companies of tomorrow. Um, and so hopefully we'll see those changes then. Yeah, great, thank you. So I'm sure there are a lot of listeners um, who wanna know how uh, to advance their career as, as a woman in tech or as a woman who's a person of color in tech. I think recruitment is one thing, clearly there's a pipeline issue, but retention is another. So what are some of the key factors drawn from your experience? And I'm asking this to the, to the, you know, to all three of you. Um, what are some of, uh, what advice would you give and how to make it through and how to clear those hurdles? I can share something that was important to me and, and that was finding a good sponsor, um, finding someone that um, believes in you, that, that is willing to help you and, um, and help you navigate some of the things that, uh, you might, you know, might have kept you from from reaching out and trying to uh, to to keep moving uh, upward. So, you know, looking for someone who maybe is already in a similar role and can provide you with advice, someone who has an opportunity to help you look for opportunities and to to um, be that uh, sponsor and support when you're reaching out for those opportunities. That's been extremely helpful to me. I can share um, just a, a personal experience of. Many of my um, female colleagues actually outside of the, the Air and Space Force have shared with me that the things that really rub them are being talked over in meetings or ignored in meetings or, or maybe not being heard. Um, and something that I've seen just as a kind of a really wonderful leadership lesson actually in the Air Force is, in, and especially at the four-star level, um, our generals make sure that they are trying to bring in input from the room. And I think in a corporate setting, you know, if you if you really make, um, you know, an effort to bring in the quieter voices, and and sometimes women don't want to jump in on top of everyone, um, you know, and so bringing those voices in, pulling people to the table, truly being inclusive, that's really huge. And and I will share too that um, I am I would not have even applied for my job had someone not said to me, you know, you're the obvious next person, right? And even hearing that, I was like, huh? You know, I'm looking over my shoulder. The job before that, I never would have applied for it even. And it's not because I'm not confident in myself. It did not occur to me. Um, and so, um, you know, I see that myself. And so I try to, as a leader, look for those people that I need to pull into that role. Um, and I've been very conscious of that as I've built um, an incredible and diverse leadership team myself. So would offer that on, on both sides of that issue. Yeah, that's interesting that you say that, Lauren. I um, I was reading a, a study recently, and in fact, when I did a I filmed a, a scene at GoDaddy several years ago for a film I made called Bias, and um, one of the ways that they were, you know, they noticed that even though they rectified the pay gap, the the gender pay gap, um, they still were having some imbalances with retention of women, and what they found is that women were less likely to put themselves in the position to um, say that they were ready for, for you know, a promotion, for example. And so they actually had to train managers how to encourage 
um, their, the women in their work floor, you know, in who they were in charge of to apply for these positions. Um, and you, I'm sure you've all seen the McKenzie study that, that shows that, you know, women are less likely to believe that they're ready for career advancement than men are, um, even when a woman might be, um, you know, even more ready for that position and more qualified. So it's really about teaching managers how to promote women and encourage women to, to take these um, next steps, which I think is interesting. Um, Sandra, did you have, do you want to add to this? Um, I mean, those are all great points. And as a manager, for sure, that's something that I wanted to be very much aware of and but would also encourage my girls that, uh, yeah, I mean, look around you and, and see who is, is being able to make those leaps. And a lot of times it's because they're willing to take a leap and they're willing to go forward, even when they don't feel like they're very, you know, they, they may be as ready. Uh, so yeah, that definitely love the idea of, of telling them, you know, helping others understand when they are ready, but encouraging them, even if you don't feel ready, try. From my perspective, yeah, I'd like to um, point out, there's like a few different types of advice we can consider here. Um, one for the people who are trying to navigate the workplace and understand how they can um, overcome some of these barriers. Um, I think there's generally understanding what the system is like and building support networks and um, also knowing that if you do encounter hardships, they may be systemic issues, not to internalize those. Um, this flavor of advice, I think, is good for people just to make the most of the situations they're in, which are which can be very extremely biased ones. Um, it sometimes rubs me the wrong way to focus on this type of advice, the sort of like uh, the critique of like lean in type of advice, which is like the system is broken. Stop telling people to lean into a broken system. Um, there's this sort of like advice for how do we fix the broken system and some of those interventions are like teaching managers how to intervene um how to set up more equitable processes some of them are just examining the power structures and like how money gets distributed how power gets distributed how decisions get made and trying to rectify the situation at a systemic level both of these are i think are important like not every person is going to want to be trying to fix the whole system and it's good to have some strategies for trying to navigate it but i also want to point out that the burden shouldn't solely be on the people who are disadvantaged by the current system to have to figure out the ways to navigate or change themselves in order to succeed well i, I think that's an excellent point um and so then you know the grander question would be how do we fix the system <laughs> And and it doesn't seem to be doesn't seem to be changing quickly enough, right? Um, do you have comments to that? I think it well, it's obviously a very big problem. Um, and now, as a startup founder, I'm looking at it a lot from the perspective of being a founder and like how does investment work and how does hiring work at the earliest stages. Um, but I think understanding how it all works is kind of the first step to then trying to figure out like what, what can we do differently. And so far, what I can see is if we start at the investment level, like even the money that's flowing into venture capital firms is come, uh, tends to be like old money or very like uh, old school institutions. The base of venture capitalists who are going to decide which startups to give money to tends to be very homogenous, mostly male, mostly white. Um, and just the way that humans normally function, like tend to want to invest in people that are similar to themselves or remind them of themselves. Um, so most of the founders that can raise money then are drawn from, again, a very similar pool. These founders, when they're hiring their early employees and leadership teams also tend to draw from similar networks. Um, and then when some startups do well, the people that get really wealthy are the investors and the founders and the early employees and leadership teams and it just perpetuates the cycle of wealth that just keeps going into the same places. Um, the people who can afford to become founders often are the ones who come from more privileged backgrounds, have a financial secure, like a safety net. Um, it is oftentimes these like early employees or people who've done really well who can then say, I'm gonna go try to do my own startup now. Um, and even like early employees who can afford to take a salary cut to go work at a startup often are again from these same pools. And so there's a whole system that we need to disrupt. Like when you think about these startups that do really well and end up becoming the big companies that hire lots of folks, they've had this bias baked in from the very beginning who, who the founders are, who the early employees are, who the leadership teams are. 
Uh, so it feels very difficult to fix this system by getting more women into STEM. Like that, that's like at the very end of this, like we need to think about like the entire structure, like how does money flow? How do decisions get made? A lot of it is based on existing networks and like knowing people being in the right places. Um, so I think the first step is understanding all of this and then in terms of like, how do we fix it? It's like disrupting all of these patterns, but I don't have a quick answer for you right now. <laughs> No, I mean, definitely I talked through some of the things that we can do though. I mean, I, I do think that in encouraging people to get into the field, like show up and play is definitely part of it. Encouraging our, like the guys in the field to, I mean, continue to incentivize diversity. I think more people, more investors are actually looking for at least some level of diversity. It, you know, I've had several conversations with male founders where they've got, you know, like the three, like 30 to 40 year old white male founders. And they're like, oh crap, you know, like we, we did it too. Like, how do we not, you know, be exactly what we said we weren't going to be. And, you know, and, and actually a little bit like, Hmm, when we're raising money, we, we probably kind of look like idiots right now. Um, so at least like those conversations are, are happening, which is probably positive. Um, and, but I think continuing to encourage people to, to pull folks in, I think the training that, um, that Sandra mentioned, you know, I'm seeing more of that, um, I'm seeing more like people just even trying. Um, and, and I agree with Tracy too. It's not just about women. It's about, you know, just like participation in general. Um, but, but, you know, like there are some things that we can start to chip away at now. And, you know, I, I definitely want to kind of do that, but I agree, Chase, Tracy, we got, we, we got a lot of work to do. Yeah, I, I like what you said, Lauren, about um, it, there's no silver bullet. Like if there was, we would have solved this problem, right? And so I, I do think, you know, attacking it from both ends, from, from the top, you know, we need that education and awareness, training, uh, incentivate, incentivizing uh, folks uh, to, to really make that effort to understand the importance. Um, so I think, you know, from the top, coming from the top down and, and trying to fix the problem is extremely important, but also I, I don't think we want to ignore the, the, the value and from bottom up, really encouraging people to um, yeah. arming them with the ability and helping support them to rise up. I, I think that, you know, there's a little bit of chicken and egg in some of this where, um, if they if if you don't see people if you don't have a role model that looks like you you may not try for it and uh therefore uh we don't have people who are going for it so getting them into those positions um looking for ways that we can help build people up and, and build diversity uh that then you know helps others want to feel like okay i can do this too so that chicken and the egg problem continues but i think if we address it from both the top and bottom i think you know that's where our success is going to come now, I think there are a lot of managers um, watching this, and, and I think that they're talk, you know, thinking about how do we, number one, recruit and to retain more women and people of color in the, in the workforce, more diversity in the workforce. Um, there's something that I learned about several years ago called the posse effect, which is you know, we can't just bring in one person of color or one woman and say they're the, first of all, the pressure and burden on that person um, to sort of be the token, right, and represent all of that race or all of womankind, which is what happens if you're the only woman in the boardroom or the only, uh, you know, say woman on the, on the engineering team. Um, so the posse effect, meaning to recruit more and to have sort of a level of um, just more of a, a being in, an in-group, right, rather than feeling like the, the out-group within the industry. So can we talk a minute about retention and, and get down to sort of specifics on your advice for a woman that is right now in a situation where she feels like she's not necessarily included, even though she's there on and part of the team? How do you retain women? How do we get women into the higher levels, into the C-suite, into the boardroom? Um, it's only going to happen if we can retain them. So recruitment's one thing, but retention's the other. Is your question more from the perspective of for the woman who's in this position, what should she do? Or is it from the manager perspective? What well, we talked about the manager, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. Thanks, Tracy. We, we talked about the manager a little bit in terms of the manager really trying to encourage promotion, encourage uh, somebody to look at their career trajectory and, and to really encourage them to move forward, right? But what's your advice for the actual, um, for the person in, for the, for the employee, for the, the engineer? 
I've got two. Um, so one, like, you know, you could go, you could take it one of two ways. One, you could be like, look, I'm looking for a really healthy corporate culture that includes me for me. And, you know, um, hey, I don't really want to change me. And so I'm going to vote with my feet and I'm going to, you know, go to a company that has built a culture that can keep my talent. You know, that that's kind of one way to go. Um, another way to go is to, to talk to the team and, or at least talk to a couple of people because there may be folks on the team that have no idea that you feel that way. Um, and, and so like, I mean, communicating with your team, communicating with your manager, kind of saying, Hey, you know, I, I think I have, um, more to contribute to the team and I, I, I think I can add more. Um, but I sometimes, you know, feel like it's a food fight to get my idea in, or, um, you know, my colleague interrupts me every time I speak or, or whatever it is. Um, I don't, I don't think that, you know, it's hard to be vulnerable like that and share those things. But I have found that when I've had, when I have talked to people that have been in that situation, and oftentimes it is kind of with a male colleague, like a kind of an ally to be like, Hey, this is how I'm feeling. Can you like, look me in the mirror and maybe like check that I'm seeing things the way that I, that I think that I am. Um, I, I have seen people be successful on both sides of that. And I think both are, are healthy for our ecosystem. I have a couple of thoughts to build on what Lauren has said. Um, one other thing you can do is try to show, like explain to the team more or to your manager more what you think your contributions are. Oftentimes um, you may be doing great work and you're just not communicating or making other people see how great it is. So people just may not be aware of all the stuff that you're doing. Um, and helping them to understand the value of your contributions can also maybe change some of the dynamics. Um, the other thing that I found really helpful throughout my career, um, and I think is generally useful is understanding what it's like across the board at different places, um, understanding what the experience is like of other people at other companies across the industry. And there's a few things that this helps with. One is you can see like, what are the patterns that are just kind of consistent everywhere? And so, you may want to vote with your feet, but if you just end up going somewhere else that has the same problems, like unfortunately you've not achieved very much with your vote. Um, and there's plenty that's broken with the system that will be problematic at every company. No company is perfect, right? So there's gonna be some set of things that will just be things you have to deal with. Um, but it's also helpful to understand like if you do know people in environments that are much more supportive and they're explicit things that you can then flag as improvements that can be made in your own workplace. Like that's very helpful as sort of like an existence proof like this. This is like being done somewhere else and it works. Um, you can bring those in as suggestions in your own workplace. I love what you guys said about building allies and um, I'll bet also reaching out and, and helping others to see what you're experiencing. Um, I had an interesting experience with one of my teams where um, there was somebody who, who brought up the fact that uh, she felt like there was one other person specifically that every time she talked, they would talk over them, that they never looked to her to provide an answer. And um, as everybody, when, as soon as she said that, we all started watching. And then it was, we all had this, oh, moment. We just didn't realize, we weren't seeing it. And it wasn't for, an, an, you know, it wasn't intentional by any means. Um, as a female, I definitely would have never, um, you know, supported that had I really realized it was happening. So sometimes we get so busy that we don't realize it's happening. We aren't slowing down to pay attention. And so, you know, just sharing that sometimes we all, it was so amazing that we all had this moment of, oh, wow, you're right. And we've been seeing it. We didn't recognize it. So I, I think sometimes it is sharing that and helping others see that. I think it's often the case that, that the person, maybe even the perpetrator, um, is very well intentioned and doesn't realize exactly you know what he or she is doing and and again not to place this all on men because it's it's not always sometimes it's women doing it to women too right so it sounds like what we really need in those situations is an ally what's your what's your advice on the best way to find an ally you know I think the big thing is looking at how they treat others and um, you know who can be helpful to you because an ally who can't be helpful is, you know, uh, going to have limited value, but who, so you need somebody that's, uh, has an opportunity to support you to, um, to provide opportunity for you. So finding someone either on a team or another manager that can speak for you too, and help encourage you that has enough visibility into what you're doing, where they can see and provide, uh, guidance for you of, 
hey, you might want to do this, give you ideas. Um, so, but somebody that has uh, proven or, or is showing every day that they care um, about your success too is, is really something that I've looked for. I like the idea of having allies, but I think it's not the wisest career advice to just seek out allies only instead of just taking ownership over your career. And hopefully there will be allies around you, but nobody is gonna care about your career as much as, or your life as much as you do. Um, and so I think there, there's maybe a bit of a perspective there around just like taking ownership. You may have a great manager who's gonna help you. You may not, you may have teammates I wanna help you, you may not. Whatever the situation is, like you are still ultimately the one who's gonna care the most and advocate for yourself the most. And you can figure out if there's other people around you who can support. Um, and I think some of the things Sandra is that you can kind of observe folks, um, are they very genuine and like wanting to be helpful? But I think ultimately it's still really your own career. Um, I don't know. May, I may have a slightly different perspective as well. Like uh, I was noting earlier as you were speaking, Sandra, about um, mentors. I don't know that I would point to anybody um, in my career as having been a mentor that's really changed the course of my career. I think there have been people at very distinct points that have done things that were very helpful or given me really useful insight or perspective. But no one that I had a sort of like sustained relationship with who was really mentoring me. And I've had people approach me to ask like, how, did you, how do you find mentors? And I have no answer to this because I have not been able to. And some of that is also just like, if you're carving out a really unique path, there may not be anybody who has relevant advice for you. Like they may just not have the same sorts of experiences that are relevant to where you are. Doesn't mean that they can't still be there and supportive in some ways, but relying too much on someone who is a mentor or an ally to help you um, I think may be counterproductive. At the end of the day, it's on you. But, but you have to have a, I mean, you have to have a team, like you have to have a support network, whether that's, you know, your family, your friends, like, you know, whoever it is. And I think the place where allies are the most helpful is when you're in a situation where it's kind of like a weird culture that maybe you don't a hundred percent understand, you know, whether it's a, a very like male tech startup culture, whether it is a military culture and you've never been in the military before, you know, whether you're joining, I mean, there, there are many ways that you can define that. Like for instance, I, you know, I met with a bunch of, um, a, a bunch of female airmen just having, having, you know, uh, conversations about just things that they've encountered. And one of the women was in maintenance. It's an incredibly male dominated field. Um, and, and she, I mean, she didn't grow up in an auto mechanic shop, you know, and, and the guys just speak, speak a completely different language, you know, like, I mean, it's just, it, it's a completely different thing, but she really wanted to prove herself and, um, and having a couple of guys that maybe weren't maintainers, but that she could talk to about kind of what was going on there that could help her translate it. Um, you know, like I, I could even tell a story about, you know, my kids on the playground where, you know, somebody would be like, oh, this just happened. And I'll be able to say, well, what I think actually just happened was this. And, and maybe they weren't being mean. I think there was an, a misunderstanding about who had the green ball, you know, like whatever it is, you know, there are times when we need help translating that, that cultural situation. And, and I will share another thing that I've seen. And I, I guess this is maybe, maybe cultural, maybe it's um, expectations of ourselves, but, but there are, there are some times when we think what is expected of us is to keep our head down and work really, really hard and punch through. But in a lot of corporate settings, and especially the more senior you go, like that is like the kiss of death. Like if you are just working and like kind of going off on your own, like A, your colleagues would be like, oh man, why are you going off and making us look bad? Or they have no idea what you're doing um, and they feel completely out of touch with you. And so I think that, um, you know, and, and early in my career, I didn't understand how important it was to have, you know, relationships. I was just like, it's about the work, right? Um, but it's, it is about the work, but it's also about how much impact you could have in your work by bringing in the whole team and by having, um, you know, by maybe even having relationships with other, pe other people in other parts of the company where you can work together to pull ideas or you can get your ideas spread to another part of the company, but just the relationships matter a lot. So what I'm hearing you say is that obviously we all need support. We need to know that we're being appreciated, but we really have to be our own self-advocate as well. Um, 
this makes me think about the competence likability dilemma. I think when we are being our own, um, you know, self-advocate and we need to be strong uh, women, especially in the United States, but not, not only in the United States, um, we tend to violate uh, gender norms, which is that we are supposed to be supportive, helpful, differential, and not necessarily assertive um, and uh, demanding and, and driven. Um, how much do you three, very successful women who have made it obviously in your careers in tech, how much do you care about being likable? Sandra, let's start with you. Um, you know, it, nobody wants to be disliked. So um, I, I would maybe say, I don't need to be disliked to be able to get my point across. Um, I don't need to be disliked to be honest. So, you know, as long as I, I think I try to focus more on transparency rather than worrying about, do they like me? Don't they? Um, when I'm uh, thinking about how I can make a difference, have an impact, speak up when I need to try to focus on what is the right thing to do? What's the right thing for the company? Um, and transparency is, is how I go about it rather than worrying about Am I being nice? Am I liked for saying this? It's it's the truth. It's it's important, and it's the focus is on the impact and the outcome rather than on me. Lauren, this is I mean, this is a really tough question. Um, I will say earlier in my career, I really didn't care. Um, you know, and not that I wasn't likable, but you know. I probably was not always likable. Um, you know, it was about the work. Um, I think the more senior you are, um, I mean, you can't be thinking like, oh, I hope everyone likes me. You know, that's that that's a recipe for like not being yourself and not being authentic. And that's absolutely not where you want to be. You have to, you have to know who you are and and walk into a room confidently with who you are and be empathetic. And I agree and be transparent. Um, but I do think that I do think that likability is important, and I, and and I think it's less about maybe people liking you, but but understanding where people are coming from. And when you're trying to get things done, um, you're going to get things done a whole lot more if you understand where the other folks in the room are coming from and what they can contribute. And I think naturally you will be more likable, where, whether you know male or female. If you come into the room and you kind of cram things down people's throats, like you're gonna you're not going to have as much buy-in. You're just not going to be as effective. And so, um, yeah, so I, I, I think, uh, I don't know if likable is the word I would use, but, but it, it is, it is more important. Tracy, your thoughts on this? Yeah, this is not a direct answer to the likable question, but, um, one thing I think about lots of difference between being nice in a sort of superficial way and being kind in a way that you care about the other person you're giving direct feedback you're helping people to be successful and sometimes the kindest thing to do is to tell somebody that they're not doing a good job and give them direct feedback or tell them like you have spinach in your teeth like sorry like <laughs> you should fix it like this is the kind thing to do even if it's uncomfortable um and i think an outcome of this is if you are being kind and you have good intentions and can communicate the context for everything you're sharing with somebody and, and how you're doing things, even if they are tough decisions um, or you're sharing tough feedback and people can understand where you're coming from and that you're doing everything in, in the best interest of the team um, and of, of the person, like the person you're talking to or the team you're working with, then hopefully they can understand that. It may not feel as nice as if you just don't give direct feedback, but still need to get things done. Um, I would say on the likability side, I probably care more about likability than the average person. Um, and I don't know how much of that is like innate personality stuff. Some of it may be reacting to stereotypes. I think also being an Asian woman, there are certain stereotypes around how Asian women are supposed to be more docile and meek and subservient and not challenge people. Um, and I do do some of that. I will call out people, but then I then want to try to be as friendly about it as I can be to balance the violation of the stereotype that can be upsetting to folks. Well, thank you three for, for answering that question. I know it's a difficult one, but uh, it's one that I'm asked often by very young people in uh, the corporate world um, who are, I even had a young woman ask me recently, 
Um, you know, should I not take the career? Should I, I have the opportunity to become the manager of um, my team, but I'm so afraid that then I won't be their pal anymore. I will be their boss and they won't like me as much. And I thought I felt for this young woman who's struggling with this because of course, I believe that all three of us would, all four of us would say to her, are you kidding? Take that, take that promotion, you know, move up, move up. Um, and don't worry as much about being likable because if you are good, if you're competent, if you're empathetic, um, then it's, and you'll be respected. And hopefully that comes along with, with being, um, with being liked for whatever that, you know, the likability is worth. I, I want to move to some audience questions. Now we have some specific audience questions. Tracy, I have one for you from, um, Aya. And she said, uh, what prompted you to start block party? Do you see a greater prevalence of online harassment toward women? Yeah, so um, just to briefly describe my company, Block Party uh, is building consumer tools for online safety and dealing with online harassment. Um, and I started the company out of unfortunate personal experience dealing with this problem. Um, so I think at this point, it's probably been like 15 years of online harassment in various forms. Um, it definitely has uh, accelerated in recent years. I think partially due to diversity and inclusion activism work I've done, but also I think the internet just has gotten even less civil over the last few years. Um, and a lot of the platforms that are out there allow people to be horrible in like these awful coordinated targeted ways. Um, and so Block Party was coming out of a lot of personal experience in dealing with this problem and also frustration that nothing was being done to solve this problem. Um, and I think some of that is due to the fact that women, minorities, people from marginalized communities are targeted more with um, online harassment and abuse. Um, we're also less represented in technology. Um, and these things are not unrelated. I think part of the problem, part of how we got to this point now where there is so much abuse is there wasn't enough representation on the teams building social media and these platforms to understand the potential misuses and the scale of them. I've heard of many examples of women, minorities, LGBTQ employees of tech companies being the ones to build the anti-harassment protections. I myself, when I joined Quora, which was at that point like a five person company, the first thing I wanted to build was a block button because somebody was already harassing me. And you think about representation on these teams, um, when you have these lived experiences, you'll bring them into your work. And I think the lack of representation on a lot of these early, um, on these early teams, also like the teams now, means that there have been a lot of misses in terms of solving for online abuse and harassment and like the misuse of these platforms. So that's how we got to now, but also in terms of like, can we solve the problem now? The, again, that intersection of people who experience abuse with the people building tech, is still not big enough. Um, so we need to solve the diversity questions, but also like in the meantime, I've, I've been frustrated by how little progress there is on solving this problem, which disproportionately affects women, minorities, um, people from marginalized communities, oftentimes the people that we most need to hear from. So like activists, journalists, politicians, um, people who have something to say and the status quo doesn't like it. Like the other ones were being targeted with harassment to silence them. And so it felt really personal to me, but also not just personal, something that really impacts a lot of people and has really widespread ramifications for society when the people we most need to hear from in terms of like how to better society are being silenced. Um, so that was kind of my long-winded answer for how I ended up getting excited and like starting Block Party. Thank you so much for that, Tracy. Um, Sandra, Vincent asks, uh, so you seem to have an exper to experience a successful career would you do anything differently if you could do it over? Oh, I, I think my answer would be, there's a lot that I wouldn't want to change, even some of my missteps, some of the tough times I went through, because, you know, all of that is what got me here. And, and I love where I am today. So I don't know that I would have changed a lot of major things, but I, I can see some opportunities that I missed that I um, should have been bolder, should have gone for that I didn't. Um, I probably would go back and encourage myself to, to you know, go for those things that I uh, didn't feel like I was uh, ready to go for. Um, but probably the other really big thing, that I think if I have any regrets in my career is really that I didn't 
I was so focused on me that I wasn't always stopping to look around to see who else was struggling the same way I was, who else could I have, you know, really helped um, along the way, uh, were there other folks that I could have been an ally for, um, were there opportunities where I could have mentored somebody that really needed it, that I could have encouraged somebody to, to uh, try something or go for something that I could see that they were ready for. Um, that's probably my biggest regret, truthfully, and something that I am very, um, uh, th that's really important to me today. It's interesting you say that, Sandra, because I've talked to several women um, who have that same feeling and that say how important it is. Women have to work so hard um, to, you know, to retain the same level um, as other people in the workforce uh, that it, often they, they don't have the time or the luxury to look up, look around, and maybe grab somebody's hand and help them up, but it's something that we should all think about taking the time to do. Uh, Lauren, a question for you from Kate. What is a mantra that you live by uh, that has contributed to your success? So I'll, I'll, I'll share a couple of things and, and you heard a couple of them already. So first lead with empathy. Um, always try to help others first. Um, and, and it's partially because it's the right thing to do, but partially because the more value that you can provide to others, the more valuable you are to the organization. And when you need help, you're going to have so many people that you can also call on to help you and you've already paid it forward. Um, assume the benefit of the doubt when you walk into the room, the more underrepresented you are, the harder that is to do. But, you know, like even on, even on your, on your kind of worst day where you're feeling very, very not so confident, I'll say that's when you kind of fake it till you make it, you know, go do your superhero pose in the ladies room if you need to, and just walk in the room like you own it. Um, and, and just assume that, that everybody knows exactly what you're bringing and show them exactly what you're there to do. And then I'll just, I'll just close with, you know, we all have a different number of doors that we can kind of go through in our career and, and just do your best that, you know, when a door opens in front of you, recognize the opportunity, decide whether you want to go through it or not. And if you do go through it, just take everything you got and nail it. Awesome. Ladies, it has been uh, such a pleasure. Tracy, Lauren, and Sandra, thank you so much. I'm just going to end the panel by saying that what I've learned and what I hope our audience is taking away from this is um, be a self, your own self-advocate, have empathy, and know that you belong in that room. Mm -hmm.